I put a ton of pressure on myself growing up to be great. And I knew from my family and my parents to chase greatness. And I loved being successful, but I didn't necessarily love soccer. Mm. And so growing up, I just wanted to be the best and I worked to be the best. And I, I don't even think I realized how joyous and wonderful what I get to do actually is uh, because I just, all I could see was failure. Well, cheers. cheers. Thank you so much for being here. This is what I love about my job. I get to talk to people about the moments that make them them, if you will, how they become who they are through good and through bad. And I know that you shared three items with us, mementos, if mm -hmm. you will, that mean a lot to you. And the first one is mala beads. Why mala beads? What do they mean for you? When I got to college and started playing in my early professional days, I actually found it quite challenging and I struggled a lot mentally uh, with the pressure and the expectations. And it was through my spiritual practice that I actually started to love what I do again. So it's almost become like my life has become like a moving meditation where I try to stay very present in what's happening and stop focusing so much on my expectation for that moment or what just happened that I didn't like. Speaking of moving, you talk about not making the national team and you made a really big decision. Was that when you were focusing and meditating in terms of what am I gonna do with my career next? Yes, so in 2012, I had played one year professionally in the US um, and I was in bed and I woke up and I checked my phone and they said that the United States Women's Professional Soccer League had folded. So for a second I thought, I I'm done, I'll never play again. And what I learned was that, you know, there's beautiful leagues all over the world and the signing window was open for four more days for me to play in Sweden. And in those four days where I was making that decision, I really emotionally thought to myself, you won't make the national team now. The plan that I had to make the national team was gone. So I'm gonna go and I'm gonna just enjoy it. I've given my life to this sport. I don't, I wanna be in control when I am done. So I moved across the world and I played for the very first time and just, I thought no one was watching and it was so freeing. And I, you know, started scoring all these goals. I was playing great. And it turned out that it was the scenic route to the national team. It was a little <laughs> detour because um, the national team coach at the time was Swedish. Mm -hmm. and she was in Sweden. Mm -hmm. And so she was watching me play all the games. And so I moved in January and I got my first call to the US Women's National Team in April of that year. In your mind, what are you thinking when you get that call? I couldn't believe it. And I had no idea she had been at the game. So I was sort of like, how could I not know that? I guess I didn't look up into the stands close enough. But at that point, you know, you get called in, all the stress comes back, all the expectations come back. And I just knew like I had to find a way, I had to find a daily habit to allow myself to be present and really enjoy what I was doing. Okay, and what does that daily habit look like? When you go out on the field, what do you do? You have your beast with you, what do you do? I walk barefoot across the field. Uh, after to ground myself yeah. and kind of like symbolize like, okay, that crazy adrenaline, testosterone thing is done. Mm -hmm. And now I'm back to being, you know, the non-football Kristen and I, I can be happy and peaceful. I have my meditation. I do a body scan to check in and see how the body's doing. You kind of actually ask it, mm -hmm. like, how are you doing down there? Oh, you I know? love it. <laughs> like, oh are you going to score today? Yeah, no, you're no, like, you're so, fine either way. Hey, I love you. You guys feel good, right? <laughs> We're going to do this today, We're right? We're going to do this, right? No, it's okay. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> Take me back to 2015 when the national team, you win the World Cup, there's a ticker tape parade in New York, I want sights, sounds, relive that moment for us. Coming back after we had won, it was like an explosion that I hadn't realized was happening the whole time. Like the whole country is watching. It was just this like life-changing moment that I really feel like the ticker tape parade symbolized. 
Um, I wasn't a person who dreamed of a ticker tape parade. I actually never liked being famous or known and that wasn't interesting to me. You know, they're, everyone's so excited, you guys have a ticker tape parade. I was like, yeah, yeah, okay, whatever, the next thing. And I cried the whole time I was on the float. Did you? And I didn't expect it. I felt like it was a, a an opportunity to actually look into the eyes of the people who cared. And I got to feel their joy. And like the best part of sports is spreading that joy. People were out, they were, it was a work day. They were out on the streets just throwing anything they had in their hands. <laughs> and I got to like see them, you know? And it just really symbolized a moment in my life where I realized how much bigger sport was than, than you know, just my role in it. You're celebrating this wonderful moment and people are cheering you on, but you're still fighting for some very basic, simple rights, mm -hmm. equal pay. Mm -hmm. The biggest realization that I had from the ticker tape parade, um, I looked at how many people cared that we won, uh, the values that, uh, that we felt we had and that we had earned, and compared that to how we were being treated and paid by our employer, and it, didn't align and it didn't feel right. Mm. And I think that without 2015 and without seeing our value like in that direct way, we might never have had the courage or even understanding of what we could do. Mm. And you know, in 2019, we won again. We had another ticker tape parade and this time it was lined with equal pay signs and girls and boys alike screaming equal pay as we went through the streets. So, I mean, that it gives was, me chills. Yeah. Like, I mean, that's a special moment. Yeah, it, and it's crazy because between 2015, that was like, oh my gosh, we've got to do something. And 2019, it was like, wow, look how much we've done. You know, look, like people know what we're doing, what we're fighting for, and what this means. 2015 was such an important year for you and obviously for the women's national team. But not only were you doing the fight for pay equity, winning World Cup, you decide to become an entrepreneur. Give me the origin story about why you decided to go in business with your teammates. So three teammates and I start a brand um, and we say, you know, we want to start a company that recognizes the value that we believe that we have. Let's bet on ourselves. And we kicked off with um, a fashion line and now we have um, a membership that really is about helping people get the inspiration and tools that they need to reimagine their lives. When you know your value and you know your worth, um, as I have seen you discover, what happens? How does your life transform? Well, sometimes I feel like people are trying to hide it from you. Yeah. It's almost like they don't want you to know your worth because when you do, you have power mm -hmm. and you have control over your own destiny. And sometimes I have to boil it down in my head to my bottom line. Like, what am I willing to put at risk to get what I want, mm. but it, it's always coming back to self-worth, um, to knowing that it is my body, these are my decisions. So even if I compromise or do something I don't feel like doing, you have to do that all the time, it's discipline, it's my choice, and then I get to own it. Um, and that's what really brings confidence um, to everything that I do. I appreciate that. And more importantly, I wanna ask you one last question about reimagining. Why gender neutral clothing? So we started with values and we started with mission. And then we didn't have a product and we said, you know, what do we love? Well, we love fashion, we love clothes. Um, what do we wear? We wear streetwear made by men for men. And most of it didn't come in our size, didn't come with us in mind, like every other product probably we're looking at is <laughs> made by men for men. And we said we have the opportunity to reimagine that. And there's a huge market of women who wear streetwear, love streetwear. Yes wishing things were just a little bit tailored um, a little bit differently. And so um, it reimagining uh, the streetwear world looked like kind of disregarding the idea that like men are supposed to be a certain way and dress a certain way and women are supposed to be a certain way. And just saying like, we're all humans, we can all wear what we want. And so our lines offer like different pieces on the spectrum of masculinity mm -hmm. to femininity. And you can kind of pick and choose whatever you want and just dress for you. And by the way, a genius business move as well, well right? For everyone. Yeah, for everyone. Cheers to reimagining. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Kristen. You're great. Cheers. Cheers.